$16.15 trillion. That is how much debt American households owed by the second quarter of 2022. A staggering 41.79% increase from $11.39 trillion just 10 years prior. The, the consumers that have a whole lot of debt really are struggling to survive. They're struggling to meet rent or mortgage payments, repay college loans, to repay loans for a car. Uh, they're struggling because they've got enormous credit card debt. 60% of American adults surveyed cited their level of debt as their main reason for financial anxiety. Debt is rising every single day, and it is something that I can say is debilitating. For me, even with a master's degree and having experience out in the field for over 10 years, I've had to have at least three jobs in order to not live paycheck to paycheck. But with inflation at its 40-year high, debt in America will likely grow. 43% of Americans are expected to add even more debt within the next six months. Debt is financing asset purchases, such as a home, such as a car. And when the price of these goods goes up, then it gets reflected in the loans that get taken out. And it's that, that juggling effect, right? Do I pay off this debt or do I go get groceries or go get gas, the things that I need to actually live. So why are so many Americans in debt today? And what impact does it have on the U.S. economy? The COVID pandemic gave many Americans a chance to improve their finances. The total personal savings rate since the pandemic averaged 12.6%, compared to just 7.25% between the Great Recession and February 2020. Americans also paid off a record $83 billion in credit card debt in 2020. To help people weather this historic crisis, all sorts of supports were extended. They offered forbearance on mortgages, on student loans, other types of debt. When my specific, one set of my student loan payments were paused, I was able to breathe. So even with that $300, that was paused specifically in loan payments, that was enough to be able to allow for me to pay off my old car. That was enough for me to be able to save a substantial amount of money in order to put a deposit down for this beautiful place that I cohabitate every single day. So all this support led to actually a, a very historically good period in, in the terms of the serious delinquency rate on student loans, on mortgage debt, on auto debt, across all these different debt types. But concerns over household debt are rising again. Government did a whole lot of things to help households and help households in debt during COVID. Now, unfortunately, those are all gone. Interest rates are starting to rise again. Federal Reserve has already increased interest rates a good deal. They've said they're gonna increase interest rates more. I will tell you how much debt I do owe. Student debt from getting my bachelor's as well as my master's degree. And then I also have debt uh, that I just started accruing in 22, purchasing a, a car that was unexpected. I have debt there, about $10,000 worth of that. And then obviously my mortgage. I owe a little under 200K on my condo. Most of the debt held by Americans is related to housing, accounting for 72.5% of the total balance. Nearly half of all Americans today say that the availability of affordable housing is a significant problem. We've seen phenomenal house price growth during the pandemic, and some of that's driven by just supply side constraints, not enough homes to go around. We also went through a decade where uh, you had to have a 700 plus credit score to qualify for a mortgage. That means that people whose credit scores were not in that strong, strong position were competing for lending dollars that were not easily available and for homes that were not easily available either. So prices just climbed and climbed. Meanwhile, student and auto loans comprise most of the non-housing debt, accounting for 35.7% and 33.7% of the total balance. College tuition for public four-year institutions rose by 179.2% between 2000 and 2020, with an average increase of 9% each year. With college education going up and up and up and up and up, it's the difference between spending a few thousand dollars, right, for your tuition and borrowing a few thousand dollars and a few tens of thousands of dollars. You get a law degree, 
you get a doctor's degree, you get an MBA, you get a PhD, now the debt levels are even larger. When it comes to just living and actually thriving, it's hard for me to say that it was worth it because almost every single day, the stress of money and actually being able to pay off student loan seems so out of reach. On August 24th, President Biden announced the cancellation of $10,000 in federal student loans for borrowers making under $125,000 annually. Student debt has received a lot of attention because the rate of serious delinquency, that's 90 plus days past due, has risen to the highest of the debt types tracked by Equifax. So it surpassed credit card debt in the past um, about 10 years. A close majority of people paying student loans are only paying interest. Uh, so they're not actually chipping away at that principal, and it means that the amount just builds up and builds up over time. That drives a lot of increases. For new vehicles, the monthly payment for auto loans climbed past $700 for the first time in August 2022. Median car loan term got a lot longer over the last 10 years. The idea of a five-year term is not really the standard anymore. Six-year often is, is what a lender will offer. And that means that people are paying more in interest over the life of their loan and those balances are just higher. Right now I owe under $10,000 for just my car payment and it truly does weigh on me. It feels very challenging just on the day to day of, okay, well I can start paying off towards my principal and pay off my car quicker or I can, you know, that, that wrestling of the question or should I put that money into savings. While inflation pushes up the price of goods and services, most Americans feel that their wages aren't keeping up with inflation. The average real hourly earnings for all employees dropped by about 3% over the last year, while inflation increased by 8.5% during the same period. I wouldn't want to say that wages are not increasing at all, but given the cost of living that Americans are experiencing, it's not rising fast enough. Wages start to flatline and people go, well, I should have a better standard of living. All of a sudden it's, I can't get it out of my wages or my income, so what do I do? Well, let's put a little bit of money on a credit card or let's buy a better car and have a little bit more car debt and we'll just pay it off over a longer period of time. Even just at my age, I wanna be able to embrace and do all the things that I want to do in life and it's constantly in the back of my head of, okay, should I pay off debt today or should I go embrace and enjoy the things that my beautiful city has to offer? No person should have to have that go through their head on a daily basis. It's not fair. For the American economy, household debt acts as a double-edged sword. On one hand, it boosts consumer spending, which contributes almost 70% of the total United States GDP. In order for the economy to keep growing, everything has to be bought. If stuff doesn't get bought, what's going to happen? Businesses will see their inventories pile up. They're going to cut back production. They're going to lay off workers. There's also good debt that can help build an individual's wealth over time, such as student loans, mortgages, or business loans. I think that some amount of consumer debt is a necessity in our economy. It makes sense in a lot of situations for people earlier in their life cycles to do more borrowing for things like higher education. But household debt that's out of control is correlated with a recession. Historically, rising household debt has been associated with lower GDP growth. The fact that households are going into debt in order to keep the economy going means that the ratio of their debt to their income is going up, and that makes them struggle more and more to be able to repay that debt. And if they can't repay that debt, sometime they reach a point where they've got to cut back because nobody will lend them more money. And that's when economies go into recessions. And if the debt to income level gets too great, then the problems for the economy can be enormous. Living with debt doesn't impact folks equally. We know that the lower income folks also have higher debt, debt burdens because that of that structural discrimination and historical discrimination that makes it so that um, they're not having the same access to financial products in the first place. The ratio measuring people's debt to their physical assets is heavily dependent on the race of the borrower. 
The ratio is 115.5% for Blacks, 65.8% for Latinos, and 98% for other races, compared to just 49.3% for Whites. The lower end of the income spectrum, the lower end of the credit score spectrum, we find that borrowers have a very hard time accessing traditional credit, like credit cards or a mortgage loan. And the credit that they do have available can be at higher interest rates and more costly. Some of it can be alternative financial services, such as a payday loan or a title loan. And these types of credit, though they serve the credit needs of these communities, to some degree, they can be quite expensive. In a lot of cases, um, the real problems are the families who are downwardly mobile, the families who were middle class, who had sort of accumulated debt based on the expectations that they would remain middle class, and then something happens in the economy. You lose your job, but you've still got your mortgage and your car payments and your college loans. Those become almost impossible to finance and it's almost impossible for you to keep your head above water. Despite its record-breaking amount, there's no reason yet to panic about the state of household debt in America. We shouldn't be panicked about the level of household debt right now. We should keep an eye on it. We should be concerned about it. And I think it's particularly important for policy leaders and leaders in the financial world to pay attention to who and where uh, we start seeing greater challenges. Based on what I'm seeing uh, at the Federal Reserve System's reporting and more broadly than that, is that there are no major warning signs of uh, disruptions like we saw during the housing crash, right? And, and the subsequent financial crisis. Policy plays a vital role in keeping household debt in check. Experts say outdated procedures such as wage garnishment, where an individual's earnings are withheld for the payment of a debt, are in dire need of a policy update. A survey found that about 7% of workers in America had their wages garnished in 2016. For folks who have high debt loads, they're actually getting their wages garnished or seized at really high rates. Currently at the federal level, only $217.50 is protected in, in someone's weekly paycheck. And that bill hasn't been updated since the late 60s. And so what we're proposing is to protect at least $1,000 in, in people's paycheck every week so that they have enough in their uh, weekly paycheck to support their family and pay their bills while managing their debts responsibly. Bringing back the child tax credit program could also help reduce household debt in America. Child tax credits were expanded under the American Rescue Plan of 2021 as a response to the COVID pandemic. A survey found that more than 77.8% of child tax credits were either spent or went to paying down household debt. And that had a huge impact on, on household finances. If you're behind a couple of hundred dollars every month and going into debt, and now the government is giving you a couple of hundred dollars because you have children, now you're whole again. You can pay all your bills for a couple of months, and if you can pay all your bills for a couple of months, you can maybe even reduce some of your prior debts. The government can also play a potential role in reducing certain kind of debt, such as medical debt that are owed by roughly 23 million Americans today. Medical debt is one in particular where the government, both federal government and state governments, have potential roles to play in helping households that are really at that individual level struggling with that. There's been a lag in the southeastern states of expanding Medicaid, right? And so we know that medical debt is going to be increasing, but if there's a way to expand Medicaid so that folks are better supported in terms of their medical expenses, that's gonna be a way to alleviate that burden. Advocates say whether the U.S. can keep the household debt in check depends on how quickly policymakers can respond to the issue. We really need interventions to make sure to help Americans bring down that debt load and so that they can be able to res spend responsibly, save responsibly, and have those long-term goals met of perhaps buying a home or building their wealth and being able to invest. 